Hey folks, I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about getting software onto your vintage CPM machines. Um, I don't think there's a video quite like this one out there. Maybe there is and I just didn't find it. Uh, I know that there are videos and other resources that tell you pretty easily how to generate disk images if you have a DOS or a Linux machine that has a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Uh, and there's probably other resources that say, hey, if you have another machine that can read and write multiple CPM formats, you can just use that machine if it already has software that will let you get uh, the, the code that you want to run on your new machine. Um, this is an Eagle 2. One of the things that was kind of unique to the Eagles, it wasn't entirely unique, but uh, these floppy drives, you'll notice that this disk says that it's a double-sided 48 track per inch disk and also known as a double-sided double density or 360k floppy if you're from the PC world. Um, the difference is, is that these drives are single-sided quad density. That means that the, uh, the read-write head width is the same as uh, say a, a 1.2 megabyte high density floppy disk but it uses standard media it uses all 80 tracks that the window will permit um, and uh, that poses a problem if you have another CPM machine that has the capability of reading different formats it probably doesn't have a head that that narrow and it probably can't half step the uh, the head in order to get all 80 tracks in there um, you have to write disk images for a machine like this on one of those 1.2 meg floppy drives. Um, it still uses MFM and it just half steps so that it can get all 80 tracks onto the disk. Uh, but one of the problems that you'll find with a computer like the Eagle 2 is that there's not a whole lot of software out there in the archives. And as you can see here, I have the original uh, that's not showing up. User's guide binder for this computer. Uh, this machine came with exactly three discs, CPM and CBASIC, Spellbinder, which is a word processor, and UltraCalc, which is a uh, spreadsheet program. Um, and that's pretty much what you'll find on the archives. Uh, maybe some other folks have made some other discs and made archives for them. I didn't see them out there. I could be wrong. Um, but this is going to talk about if you have a machine that you can boot, uh, how you get more software onto it. So one of the problems that I had, and you might see that I've got this little piece of media laying out here, and you might also notice when the light hits it just right. Let me see if I can get the, see that little defect right there? This, this was the original disc that was inside that jacket, and it has... A little bump on it there and maybe some other defects this was the felt side of the drive so that little scratch around there doesn't really matter but that little bump right there is a big part of the problem that I had with this disc so what I did was I went online I grabbed the image for this that somebody had grace gracefully uh, graciously uploaded and I copied it onto a brand new blank floppy cut that floppy open and uh, you can see that there is a disk inside of here and if you look really carefully I got just a smidge of super glue came out the edge there I used an exacto knife to trim this back flap open and slid the new media into the original disks jacket um, so now what we have is a running version of Eagle CPM um, CPM is a common operating system, but for those that are kind of new to this, uh, every machine is different. Every machine has uh, its, its disk controller, its serial ports, its parallel ports, whatever accessories it has installed are all in different memory locations. So you'll notice that here on this disk there's a thing called ebios.asm and another one called icpm60.asm. These contain information that is specific to this machine. Not every vendor has sent this with the machine, so it can be a little challenging sometimes to figure out exactly where the devices are mapped into memory. 
uh, in the case of what we're about to do, which is I'm going to teach you how to get uh, data across a serial port from another, another machine, um, you have to know things like uh, what port is the serial port's data port, what is its status or control port, uh, what bytes should it be looking for to tell it if it has data waiting for receive, etc., etc. Um, and in some cases, on some machines, you even have to initialize the serial controller first. And so you're, you're, whatever you're going to be doing has to know something about that. So what we have here is just the very basic CPM system utility disk with some C basic stuff down here on the bottom line. Um, You'll notice that uh, there are some familiar things for, for CPM users like PIP and Sysgen. And in the case of the Eagle, your disk management utility is called DiskUtil. And I'll just go ahead and load that up. And it's just a little menu-driven thing. This is for single-sided floppy disk utility program for the Eagle 2. So what operation would you like to perform? Well, in Drive 2, I have a brand new blank floppy. Technically, that's drive B, but here it's going to say press 4 to format the diskette in the bottom drive. So I'm going to press 4. It's going to say, any information is going to be destroyed. Are you sure? I say, yes. And this guy lights up, and he starts doing a uh, format, and he's also reading to make sure that uh, everything is, uh, is getting written to the disk properly. And so that'll take just a little bit to finish, and uh, when that comes back, I'll show you the next step. Okay, so that is finished, and so I'll exit that program, and we can then see by doing a directory of the B drive that it has no files stored. If I do a directory of the A drive, it still has the same files on it. If I do a stat of the B drive, we'll see that it has 384K free, which is the maximum capacity of a single-sided quad density drive. Um, so what do we do now? Well, there's a couple of options. There, first of all, it's important to know that uh, every, every Unix, or excuse me, CPM program that has ever been known to exist is already out on the internet in various archives. If I do uh, uh, look at this file called More All Files uh, of the Walnut CD, it shows me just tons and tons and tons of stuff that exists out in the world of CPM. A lot of this stuff will run on just about any machine, and some of these things have uh, have some some overlay files that help adapt it to a specific machine like the Eagle 2. Um, inside the Walnut CD archive is a directory called Start Kit, and inside, uh, sorry, in CPM directory of that, there's one called Start Kit. And so if I do a look and see what all is in here, there's a lot of files that are really useful to you getting started out trying to do software with your, with your computer, uh, your, your CPM machine. So you've got like B-Modem Basic, which uh, is, is one way of getting some files using Basic. Um, you've got various CRC things. You've got Crunchers, Library Utils, um, LU is a great one. Um, this thing called mboot3 and pip modem that we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, as well as squeeze, unsqueeze, arc, unarc, uh, uncrunch for 8080 and Z80 machines, uh, unzip, zip wasn't used a whole lot with CPM, but some things in the archive are stored, of, stored with zip, uh, UUN code and UUD code, which are very handy for sending uh, binary files in an ASCII format. That doesn't get used quite so much anymore, but you never know when you might need it, so it's in the start kit. So two, the two things that I pointed out by name and said that we would come back and look at them in a moment are mboot3 and pip modem. Now you'll notice that both of these have an assembly uh, name on the end of them because they are 8080Z80 assembly language. Um, a lot of stuff that you'll get for CPM, and this is a comment for the new guys, will come in assembly language format. 
It may be a COM file. The COM file will probably run, uh, but if it has anything specific that's compiled into it uh, that is specific to a, a certain hardware location or something like that, it won't work on your machine unless you do something to fix that. So, what is mboot3 and what is pip modem? Okay, pip modem is an overlay for pip which we get with CPM. It's included with every CPM distribution. And the reason for that is because PIP is how you control uh, I.O. redirection uh, and copying files, especially copying files from one disk to another. Like, for example, right now, if I do PIP B colon equals A colon PIP dot com, you will see that uh, the first drive lights up and it starts moving that file over to the second drive and uh, when it's done we come back to our A prompt if I tell it to give me a directory of drive B we'll see that pip.com is over there now so pip is very handy for a lot of things and what pip modem does is it gives you the ability to um, use a special device in CPM that's specific to PIP called INP colon, stands for input, um, and turn PIP into a terminal program. So you don't have a terminal program because none of these disks come with a terminal program, and PIP would allow you to connect to a BBS and download something like mboot3. Um, the reason why you can't download a whole lot of stuff with PIP modem is because PIP itself, depending on the architecture and how much free memory your machine has, uh, PIP has a very small text buffer. And whenever the buffer fills up, it needs to uh, write to the disk. It needs to tell the remote end, stop sending me data. I'm no longer buffering data. I need to write this to the disk. Well, that doesn't work so well. So, PIP modem works great if you're transferring files that are less than, let's say, 20K on average. And it varies from machine to machine. Um, the thing that's advantageous about PIP modem is that somebody can give it to you um, with, uh, with a printout, just a printout of the program, and it's a fairly short program. You can go into ed, which is included right there, ed, which is a, a line editor. And you can type this program in line by line from a printout. There we go. I, I told it to more the file, and I don't think it even had a full page worth on the second page. So, you know, it's, uh, let's see, hitmodem.asm. It's 63 lines long, and most of that is the, uh, the comments up here at the top. Well, I guess maybe not most, but there are some comments. So it is conceivable that you could type this from the printout or from another computer that you have that's displaying it, like what I have here. Um, this is really only necessary if you need... A, you need to interact with the, the remote system to tell it which file you want to have sent to you and or B, if your CPM doesn't already have uh, BDOS devices configured inside the BIOS for the serial ports. So in the case of uh, the Eagle, they included the eBIOS.ASM here, and we can flip through this guy and we can see, oops, I accidentally hit Control A, which is an abort on this machine type. Uh, e BIOS ASM and hit the correct key to pause it. So I'll pause it as we go through so I can show you some of the stuff. So here it's showing me that my serial I.O. ports for the A and B ports, this is SIO A data, SIO A status, same for the B data and B status because this machine has two serial ports and their hex addresses for their ports. It's also going to tell me, you know, the receive byte would be one if I have a character ready to receive, and I'll put a T into that memory address. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll put that byte on the status port if I need to, to transmit a character. 
So um, some of these, uh, these things that are kind of hard to figure out on some machines were already answered for me here. And because of that, I could also scroll all the way through this big long listing. And uh, here we have some stuff about console status and uh, some stuff for setting the baud rate. And at some point, uh, there is something in here that I'm not going to dig all the way into this big long file where it tells me basically that these two serial ports are set up as user punch reader ports. So every uh, Unix installation has the ability to define a device as UP1 or UP2 and UR1 and UR2. Uh, your machine might as well. It may be a different, uh, a different port entirely. Um, but these names go back to very old days in CPM where you might have a paper tape punch or reader that you need to use in order to get data in and out of the system. So UP1 is the transmit side of, uh, of serial A and UR the reader side of serial A. So what I can do actually is I'll jump onto the B drive here. I'll show you that it's still empty. We'll say pip b colon m boot 3asm equals ur1 colon. So what I'm telling pip to do is on the B drive open a file called mboot 3asm and I want the contents of user reader 1 to go into that file. And so whenever I hit enter, it's going to load pip, it's going to open that file, and it's going to seem like the computer just locked up. Now, if I walk across my messy room here and come over here, I have a DOS machine that is running QModem. It's set up at 9600, which I should have shown you that I'd set up the port on the other side at 9600 as well. I apologize for that. It'll be different if you have a different kind of machine anyway. Um, and what I'll do is I'll tell it I want to upload with ASCII the mboot, where is it? mboot3 ASM. And now it's going to truck along. It's going to push that file over there. And it's done. But... On the other end of this, nothing has happened yet. And this is another thing that PIP modem will give you control over, is the ability to send the end of file character, which is control Z. And I hit control Z, and then we walk back across the messy room, and we'll see that this guy is busy saving that file out, and he's already returned back to the command prompt. If I do a directory, there's mboot3.asm. Now, I already edited this file before transferring it, so what we'll see in here is, um, uh, for this machine I've set fast clock equals true, because this machine does have a 4 MHz clock. Uh, the default in the archive is that the PMMI modem is configured as true, I set that to false. And I don't need to initialize my port, so I set it to false, and then... If not PMMI and not DC Hayes, then this is where we configure the port. So uh, the modem data port for serial A is at 18 hex. The modem control port or status port is at 19 hex. Uh, test for send and value when ready are 4. And bit for receive to test for receive and value when ready are 1. And so there we go. So why modem 3? I haven't even said anything about that yet. Mod or excuse me, mboot 3, not modem 3. mboot 3 um, implements X modem protocol on the, on the uh, serial port. So we've configured it now to be on this machine's serial A with all the correct information here. And I am going to tell it to A, assembler mboot3 now this is where it gets confusing because if you're a new guy to CPM or you have used CPM and you never did much assembly work um, the file name of course is .asm but uh, the assembler uses the file code to set options for how you want the assembler to behave so whenever I say AAZ I'm telling it not to give me a listing output not to give me a print output not to do anything crazy just compile the 
assemble the code and create a hex file. And so, oh, oops, I forgot to tell it that it was on the B drive, B, M boot 3, even though I'm logged there, sometimes some utilities will assume that you want it to be on the same, same drive as where you're pulling the, the assembly program from. So it's doing an assembly of this short program, and if there are no errors, it will come back with uh, just some basic information about how many bytes it compiled and stuff like that. And uh, it's done assembling, and so now I have a mboot3 hex. So I need to tell it a colon load, which is what converts hex files into uh, executable com files. Load b mboot dot hex and so it's going to do a couple of things it's going to tell me a little bit and now I have mboot3.com so if I do mboot3 it didn't I didn't give it a file name well how in the heck am I going to give it a file name okay so we say mboot3 now here's where we go into the next step I haven't even said anything about this yet. Uh, mboot3 is great. If you need to get a couple of files, it can be very tedious to say mboot3, a file name, and then go start your transfer, and whenever it's done, it drops you back to the command prompt, and then you got to do mboot3 and a new file name. There's a better way. We just use a terminal program like what, uh, what we used to use back in the day. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get... Uh, a file called m7egl-1.asm that is the uh, the eagle 2 eagle 3 overlay file for a program called modem 7 and so I start mboot 3 and it says here we are we're in terminal mode basically if I say hi there nothing echoes back but on that DOS machine across the room it says hi there on the screen and you'll see that in a second so we'll just go ahead and go on over there messy room messy room and yeah see he says hi there I typed that from the other computer so what I want to do now is I want to do an upload and focus I'm going to do X modem upload and I'm going to send that M7 EGL1 ASM which is about a 10k file and he says he's waiting for NAC, which is part of the X modem protocol. So I come back over to this guy. He says press escape to start the file transfer. So I hit escape. He opens the file. He's ready to receive. And now we're just waiting for the two machines to sync up. The sender is still saying waiting for NAC. And here in a few seconds, it will start the transfer for this guy. And it's started. And so every now and then, maybe at the end of this file, uh, nope, it's already writing. And because of the way X modem protocol works, the protocol is established to where the sender will not send any more packets until the receiver has acknowledged it. So if the receiver needs to write its buffer to disk, it just doesn't acknowledge the packet until the, uh, the, the file has come through. Now, see, it's already dropped me back out, and it says, don't forget to disconnect modem. Well, I'm not using a modem today, but what we want to do next is mboot3 modm700.asm, and basically it's going to be the same thing all over again, uh, except this is a much larger file. It's a uh, xmodem. It's like 150k. And so we'll go ahead and get that one going. He says waiting for NAC. And we're back over here and I hit escape. And so they're going to begin that transfer. It'll take probably a few minutes for that to transfer even at uh, 9600 BPS. So I will pick this back up whenever that's. So while I'm waiting for that file transfer to finish and it's, it's going along, you'll see here that it, it writes every few bytes. It's like it does it does four or five blocks and then it does a write. And the block is 128 bytes. But while it's doing that, I'm gonna show you where I got this modem 7 stuff from. It's also on the Walnut CD under CPM modems modem 7. There are a few 
um, communications programs that have overlays for this particular computer uh, and have overlays for a lot of them. A lot of the files that you see here are overlays that are specific to a, to, to a computer. Uh, you'll find things in there for like Epson's and Franklin's and Apple's and you know just about anything that can run uh, CPM even if it needs a, a coprocessor card like the Apple II does. So um, basically I chose Modem 7 because it's the root of all the others for the most part. There are a few that are different, but you have like Modem 7, Imp, and Mex are the three most common ones. And uh, all of those have lots and lots of overlays available for them, but unfortunately the archival process was not able to capture all of them for all the machines. Uh, only Imp and Modem 7 have an overlay for Eagle 2. So I'm just going to use uh, the, the one for Modem 7 and uh, the latest version of Modem 7. Uh, that transfer over there is almost finished. You can see the status bar on the bottom of it. Maybe I can get it to focus on the screen from here. Maybe, yeah, you can kind of see that it's still trucking along. And it's almost done. So I'll go ahead and keep this video going because it only has uh, about hundred less than a hundred blocks left to go so here we are it's trucking along and almost done about 20 more to go and it's done and so it's done writing that out so now if I do a directory of the B drive we see that we have the two new files M7 EGL1 and modem 700 now, in some cases, for some of these packages, you might need to um, edit one or both of those files in order to get this to work right, but in this case, I don't need to edit either of them. And what I can do is A colon ASM B colon M7 EGL-1 dot AAZ. That's going to create a hex file for me for the overlay. It won't take very long because it's a very small file. And there we go. And then the next thing that I need to do is A colon ASM B colon modem 700 dot AAZ. This one's going to take a while because that's 150k text file because it has lots and lots of comments in it um, and it will compile down to uh, a big bunch of hex and then we'll have to load that hex and so I'm gonna let this guy get started to do that and then we'll cut back to it whenever okay it's assembly is finishing up here get the camera to focus assembly has finished I will tell it a colon load B colon modem 700 dot hex and it will go ahead and create a an executable file out of that hex file that the assembler made getting it all linked up it's kind of a peculiar thing about this machine is that whenever no discs are selected both disk drives have a very dim LED and whenever one of them is selected whichever one isn't goes completely dim. Uh, I have some other machines that do it like that too but I wanted to explain that it's not actually doing anything with the A drive. <laughs> and so this should be just about done. So while that's finishing up I'm going to come over here and I'm going to talk about the overlay file for this machine. Uh, you'll see up here at the top that in 1984, Dennis Reckla did this. Uh, Dennis and I knew each other whenever I was just a young boy. Uh, he worked with my dad. He was responsible for my dad getting me onto BBSs. And a uh, big shout out to Dennis. If it hadn't been for your influence, I would not be the person I am today, as I've told you before on Facebook. I uh, don't know if you'll ever see this, uh, this video, but there you go. So in the opening comments of this, Dennis put in information on how to put the overlay into the COM file. 
And you'll notice down here he says this may vary with new versions of modem7.com. And what he's talking about is this number on the save command. Uh, I've already gone back and looked at the version that I'm compiling from, and it says that I should use 73 for that value instead of 66. But other than that, all the directions that Dennis provides there are still going to be the same. So I'm going to say A colon DDT B colon MODM700.com and that's going to bring up DDT, which is the dynamic debugging tool. And so we're in the debugger now. I'm going to tell it I would like to insert modem7 egl one dot hex and so it now has that set for being inserted into there and I've got to tell it to read the file and so it's going to go read that file and now that we're done we say G0 that takes us back into CPM and I will say uh, save 73 MDM 7.com I'm saving it to a different one so that if I wanted to change something in the overlay, I still have that original compiled file, which took about five minutes to compile or assemble. And so now it's going to save that memory region to a new file called mdm7.com. So I say directory. And here's all the files. None of these files existed before this video started so many minutes ago. Uh, I copied pip from another disk and everything else came over serial using pip, then mboot, and we compiled mboot, and then we got the overlay and modem 7, we compiled both of them, and we then used ddt to pull the hex for the overlay into this new file called modem 7, which overlaid it on top of modem 700. So if I do MDM7 now, it'll come up and say it's modem 7 for the Eagle 2. And there we have it. It says online help. If you hit M, it will show you what all of the stuff, all the stuff that you can do. And so um, this also gives you X modem and it gives you a full terminal. So I could say T and I'm in terminal mode and I, if I type something, this is in terminal mode on mdm7.com and you don't see any of that get echoed by, back there but oh haha so control E will take me back I need to do a set because I'm at the wrong baud rate now remember I said you can edit some things in the overlays the default baud rate is one of those it defaults to 300 well we're using 9600 so if I set that there and then let's do uh, terminal with echo instead of regular terminal and I'll say this is modem 7 on the eagle 2 and so now Whenever I come over here to the DOS machine, it still says hi there up there from whenever we had uh, mboot3 going, but this is modem7 on the Eagle 2. Now if I want to send something else, I could say let's do an X modem CRC because that one does CRCs instead of checksums by default. And uh, let's just say... Um, well, I don't really have anything, but... Uh, Ah, Nulu. Nulu would be good to have. That's another thing that comes off of the uh, start kit directory. That's a library archive uh, utility. And so now he's waiting for NAC. And we'll come over here and we'll see that we're still in terminal mode on the Eagle. If I hit Control E, it takes me back to the command prompt for modem 7. And let me get this to where it'll focus a little better. And I can say receive nulu151.com and it's going to try and sync up and there it goes it's receiving just trucking right along almost done 95 98 100 percent 
And so that puts us back into terminal mode. And so I'm communicating with that DOS machine. And uh, I have a file there. And if I want to receive another one, I'm still connected. I can just say receive whatever file name, and it's going to go and try and receive that file. So uh, I'll just go ahead and reset the machine. And so basically, uh, it looks like I, uh, I may have trashed the disk that we just built on the B drive. Um, by rebooting the machine while the program still had a file open on it and it may have trashed the uh, directory index but uh, you get the gist of what I was trying to teach you there and uh, hopefully it'll help you out and uh, and everything will be good going forward for you you can uh, definitely look through the walnut and oak and other CPM archives and just find tons and tons of data out there and tons and tons of programs that may or may not be interesting and uh, once once you've got managed to get uh, at least mboot 3 running on your system you have the ability to pull data from other machines uh, from those archives so that you can get them onto the disks that are on your weird machine that uh, nothing else will read or write the disks for so I hope that was helpful. hope you enjoyed it. And if you're still here, kudos to you. Uh, most folks wouldn't be so dedicated. And uh, I appreciate you, and, and thanks for helping keep this old hardware alive. It's part of our computing history, and uh, I think it's important for us to maintain that. So have a great day, and enjoy your CPM machine. Bye.